One of the questions on exam one, I think this is the one other than possibly the related question about how you would design a modern processor today that involved lots of speculation. But this was the one I was most disappointed in your answers. I think most of the questions people did quite well on, and I was satisfied with your answers. This one, I mean, we didn't talk about it too much in detail in class, but many of the answers revealed some confusion about what's really going on in hardware-based memory isolation. So I want to talk about that some, and that will also tie in to the new things that we're going to do. What does it mean to have hardware-based memory isolation? So we're starting with some code. Suppose we've got a Rust program or some other language, but let's assume it's Rust for now. And we've done an assignment to some index of an array. What are the next steps? If we're getting hardware-based memory protection, actually, let's, let's assume this is not Rust for now. It'll make more sense if, if we assume this is C code. So this is going to compile to some code. What's the compiled code going to look like? Yes. Assembly, OK. Yeah, I guess, so, so the, the machine code is going to look like a bunch of zeros and ones. It's going to be pretty meaningless to us. So what's the assembly going to look like? Yes. Good. So it's doing some computation, right? It's got some address. It's loaded some value that is the location of A. It's added what's in I. And then it's doing some store to that computed location. And so somewhere there's some kind of store like this. And we don't know what the actual value is, but there's some computed value. Let's say this is going to be A plus I in some register. And we're storing into that location. From the assembly code, turn into meaningless zeros and ones. Well, meaningful to the processor, not too meaningful to us unless we disassemble them and turn them back into things that are easier to, for humans to read. So do we have any memory isolation yet? Does it make sense to ask whether we have memory isolation yet? So what does it mean to ask if we have memory isolation? What is memory isolation supposed to provide? So one of the other questions on the exam, which most people answer quite well, and everyone should have answered quite well, because we had pretty clear discussions in class of what I think a good answer to it is, is what is a process? And one of the things a process provides is memory isolation. Process is this abstraction that a program owns the whole machine while it's running. And it owns the whole machine because no other program can bash on its memory. In order to know that this code has memory isolation, what do we want to know about this program or what happens when we run this program? So where do people go over spring break? So what would it mean to have memory isolation? Yes. OK. So I guess there are two sides to it. right? We want to know other programs can't mess with us. And in order for a system to provide that, we need to know this program can't mess with other programs. So memory isolation kind of assumes both of those things. To say that we're running this program with memory isolation is more asking the question of, can it bash on other programs, memory space, rather than can other programs bash on it? Because there could be others running, certainly the kernel, can bash on the memory space of this program if it wants to. But what we want to know is that when this store happens, that whatever address this ends up being at runtime, if it's not in the memory space of this process, then it's not allowed. At this point, all we have is a program. We don't have anything running yet. And whether it has memory isolation or not is not really a property of the program. It's a property of the execution. So we could run this program in ways that don't have memory isolation at all. If we ran it at kernel level with nothing else going on, this instruction could bash on any location in memory. But if we run it as a user level process on an operating system that provides memory isolation, when it's going to run, so we've started the program now, it's been loaded into memory, now we've got a process that's actually running code. This is going to be turned into some real location, and that location goes through our memory translation system. If we have hardware memory isolation, and that's a bad address, that's an address that's outside of this process's memory space. What's supposed to happen? Yes. OK, good. So where, where is that going to happen? So at some point, it's not going to allow that right to happen. Right? So there's going to be something that prevents that right from happening. Where in this process is that happening? Is it before or after this? So is, is it before we get to here or after we get to there? OK, good. Yeah, so it's after the segmentation. It's at the point where we're mapping a linear address into a physical address. And this is the paging unit that's going to say, look at the page. Right? Remember, we have a page in the page table. In the page table, there's some protection bits. And those bits will tell us whether or not this process can write to that page or read from that page. In this case, we're doing a write. So if the write bit is not set on the page that we're trying to write to, this part of the hardware is going to not allow it to go through. And some signal is going to be sent on some wire that eventually is going to cause an interrupt in the operating system that prevents this process from continuing to run. 
That's where it stops. And this is hardware because this is in the physical processor. Right? The physical processor has a data structure that it's represented somewhere that's got the page table, and there's some wire, some transistors there that are doing this test and preventing that store from happening. In the ARM, we've got these two bits that are the access permissions. There's one for reading and one for writing. I'm not sure which one is which. And if that write bit is not a one for the page we're looking at, then we're going to have the hardware fault happen. Now, there's still a lot of software involved. So we're saying hardware memory isolation is this nice, simple, probably few thousand transistors that are doing this test and not allowing this write to happen if that bit is wrong. What else does this depend on? Does this depend on any software? So how come that bit is a zero on a page that you're not supposed to write to? How did that bit get to be a zero or get to be a one in cases where it is a page that you can write to? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So that was up to the kernel. There's still a lot of software and a lot of complexity going on. The kernel, when it loaded this process and transferred control over to it, had to set up the page table in the right way. It had to set up the page table where this bit was a zero for all the pages that that process should not be able to write to. So there's still plenty of, you know, this hardware-software distinction is pretty fuzzy, but it's called hardware-based memory isolation because at least this check that causes the fail is a really simple thing being done in the processor hardware at runtime. What happens when you're actually checking the address is done at a very low level in hardware. That's why we have a fair bit of confidence that at least that's going to be correct. Setting these bits is much more complicated. That's up to the operating system, but this is something that the kernel better get right. If it doesn't get that right, lots of other things are going to break. These are the different values of, of those bits. So if it was not a read-write page set with the, both of those Actually, yeah, I guess you can't have a non-readable but writable page. In theory, you could, but at least not in this table. So you need that bit to be set or the write won't be allowed. So what about software-based memory isolation? So what is different in software-based memory isolation? So now let's assume that this is Rust code instead of C code. Does everything happen the same way it happens on this slide? So we talked about software-based memory isolation being done by native client in Chrome, where all these different programs running in the browser all the, the plugins will run in a protected way. As far as the operating system is concerned, how many processes are there? All of those plugins could be running the same process. Right? They're running in the main Chrome process. As far as the operating system is concerned, they have access to everything that Chrome has access to. For security, they're only supposed to have access to their own memory. They're not supposed to have access to everything that Chrome has access to. For that to work, at this level, this doesn't know anything about browser plugins. This knows about the process, and everything that's running that process is treated exactly the same. That's why native client needs to provide memory isolation somewhere else. What about Rust? When you run a Rust program, assuming there are no bugs in the Rust library, which I know is not always a true assumption, can you ever get to this kind of fail when you're running a normal Rust program and there are no bugs in it, and you have no unsafe code? Yeah, you should never get to there. Part of the reason you better not get to there is part of what Rust is guaranteeing is in a task, memory is protected from other tasks. You have memory isolation between tasks, but the tasks are all in the same process. So if you are relying on this hardware to provide the memory isolation between tasks, they would have to be separate processes. because That's all the hardware knows at this level. But they're not. We want them to run in the same process. So what is different if this were a Rust program? Where's the first step that things are different? So is the code that comes out of the compiler, does it still look pretty much like that, or is it quite different? Here's our Rust program that is modeling what was there. Here's our assignment, which is out of the bounds of that array. When we run that, we get a runtime error. We get an error that says index out of bounds. That is not being generated by the hardware memory protection. That's being generated long before any request gets to storage. If we want to understand more, we can look at the assembly code. This is the assembly code that's generated for that program. So there's a bunch of code to calculate the address and a bunch of code that's checking that it's in bounds, and then we're doing a jump, a conditional jump. If it's not in bounds, it's jumping to this code, which is calling this fail bounds check function that is producing that error message. These things are setting up the stack so we can have this nice error message that says these things in the parameters, and then it's calling the fail bounds check, which is printing that message and failing. All of this is happening in software. It's never getting to the hardware that checks that store. It's all being checked because the compiled code instead of just doing a store, is doing a bunch of other stuff first. It's doing a bunch of stuff to check that that store is safe. If we had a really smart compiler, maybe at compile time it could determine for some stores that they're always safe. 
If that's what you want to avoid all this runtime cost, if you can prove that it's always safe, you don't need that. But if you can't prove it's safe, you need that, and you're going to get the runtime error, and you never get the hardware fault. Rust is providing software-based memory isolation. What about native client? The difference here is native client's taking a binary. To use native client, you don't have to write your program in Rust or Java or some type safe language. You have a binary that gets plugged into Chrome. Now, it does have to be a little bit special, but it's basically a binary. You don't have any choice over this part. You're still starting with code that could have arbitrary loads and stores in it without any protection around it. If you want to do software-based memory isolation and you don't own the compiler, what do you have to do? Yes, thank you. Save the rest of the class from having to stand up, at least temporarily. You're welcome to stand up if you want, but go ahead. Yeah, well, so you don't control the programmer. You're the browser. Some plugin is getting installed in your browser, and the browser wants to run that plugin in a safe way. So at this point, you don't control the programmer who created the plugin. You don't control the compiler they use. They're sending you a binary, and you want to run it in a safe way. Yes. Um, so you could run it in its own process. Right, that's the safest thing to do. And then you are getting hardware-based memory protection. Native client plugins don't want to do that because they actually need a lot of communication with the browser. So if it's running its own process and you want it to still interact with the user who's using the browser, then you've got a hard thing to set up all those channels and it's going to be very expensive. So, yeah. So what does it mean to sandbox it? Well, what you do control, you're getting this binary that's coming in. You can do something with that binary. You control the loader, you control how that code gets into the process, and you can transform it. That's what tools like Native Client do. Before they start running that code, they try to transform it in ways that put in all those checks that the Rust compiler puts in when you compile Rust code. It's a lot tougher to do this on a binary. You've got to figure out what the binary is doing. So this is a hard thing. Every major attempt to do this has some flaws. So they had the pawn to own contest last week. I think it was in Vancouver. Every single browser that's trying to do this kind of sandboxing had some flaw in it. But they're getting better. Finding most of these flaws is still pretty tricky. But there's a lot of complexity to do that. You've got to know that you're able to identify the code, which is already a pretty hard problem. And you've got to know that there aren't any ways to, to circumvent the checks and that you're always putting the right checks there. It's definitely more complicated to do software-based memory isolation, especially if you don't control the programming language in the compiler. Which one is more expensive? And lots of the answers focused on you know, what one was more expensive. Your answers are about evenly divided in terms of saying whether hardware-based was faster or less expensive or saying that software-based was faster or less expensive. Both answers could be correct. It really depends on how you look at cost. Today, software-based is definitely more expensive. And part of the reason for that, all the software-based memory protections I know of, they're already running on top of hardware that has hardware-based memory protection. So you're always paying the original cost of adding all that complexity to your hardware plus the added cost of software-based protection. That's more of an artifact of processor design and everything else, the fact that you need both. If you could design things from scratch, maybe you could have a processor that doesn't provide any memory protection and everything is done in software. And then maybe if your compiler is really, really clever, you don't need a lot of checks at runtime. You can statically prove most of the accesses to memory are safe. State-of-the-art compilers today cannot do this very much. It's a really hard problem. So, Today, it's definitely, in terms of runtime cost, much less to do hardware-based memory isolation. You need to design your processor for this, but it's not a huge amount of complexity. It's basically checking that bit in the page table before you allow a loader store to happen. There's complexity in the operating system to set up these pages. Any questions about that? Do we feel ready to enter the kernel? Because okay, when we enter the kernel, we're going to give up all these hardware-level memory protections. So we should be really happy that we have them before we give them up. <laughs>